Good evening, everyone. Everyone say hi, Amanda. Thank you for playing along. I was on a hike last weekend with some friends, and they were way across this gulch over on the other side of the mountain, and I hear them all say, hi, Amanda, across the gulch. It was kind of awesome. <laughs> I knew they were talking to me. Anyway, my name is Amanda Thomas, and I am your mistress of ceremonies this evening, and I'd love to welcome you to Nerd Night. Yay! <laughs> As you know, we are here to talk about cataclysms on the Columbia, the great Missoula floods. I'm very excited to have Dr. Scott Burns here. How many of you, have any of you seen Scott speak before? Okay, a fair handful of you. Well, you and the rest of you who haven't seen him speak before, you're in for a treat. He's a lot of fun. He um, quite literally wrote the book on this topic. <laughs> Um, this book, Cataclysms on the Columbia, we do have for sale uh, in, the, in the lobby, and all of the proceeds go to the student press at PSU. He'll be talking more about that. Very, Like I said, very excited to have Scott here. He and I have been working together for, I don't know, five years or more. He's done a bunch of different events for me, so I'm very pleased to have him here. This is the first time I think he's spoken on this topic in Vancouver. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, the uh, fascinating and fun Dr. Scott Burns. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the greatest geological event to hit this, the Portland-Vancouver area, and has shaped the topography and wherever you go, every time you go up or down a hill, uh, it's probably a result of the Missoula floods. Uh, and so way back in, as you can see up here, this is the cover of the book, by the way, and this is up in the Hanford Reach of the Columbia River. John Elliott Allen uh, and Marjorie Burns wrote the first book about this, and this was back in 1986. Uh, John formed the uh, geology department at Portland State. Marjorie uh, had just retired as a uh, English professor, Dickens novelist at Portland State, and then I'm a geology professor at Portland State. I've been there for 24 years and just recently retired, but they hired me back as an adjunct professor this spring. Uh, so all three of us are native Oregonians. Uh, all three of us have taught at Portland State. John died now 18 years ago, uh, and, uh, and, and Marjorie is an English professor. She couldn't up uh, update the book. And so a few years ago, I did because I've been doing research in this area for the last 20 some years. Uh, and so it's published, you can see back up here, by Ooligan Press. And Ooligan Press uh, is a graduate program in uh, writing and publishing at Portland State. And so all of the students that worked on this book were all Portland State grads and English majors in particular. Uh, and, and for me, it was great. The, 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 they would correct some of my grammar and my English, but for Marjorie being an English professor to have students correct her work, it was kind of difficult, but it was fun. And, and everything at Portland State is sustainable. Uh, and so this book is, and in fact, the first three books, uh, three pages in the book are about how sustainable this book is with the paper and the print and everything. In fact, when you finish the book, you can eat it. It's that good. Uh, and so I just thought I would throw that in uh, at the beginning. Uh, so I wanted to show you the co-authors, and this is John Elliott Allen, uh, who, it was his vision to bring this incredible geological event uh, to people who are non-geologists. And then there's my beautiful co-author, Marjorie. She actually lives in Washington. She lives up in Trout Lake. Uh, and so those are the three of us that are here. This is my favorite picture in the book because this is a picture uh, looking up the gorge. This is from Chanticleer Point, looking down on Crown Point. And you can imagine 15 to 18,000 years ago when these great floods came down the gorge and they filled up this area all the way up to Crown Point. Uh, and they did it at least 40 times uh, that came down into the Portland area. And it scoured out. Now, the great gorge was always there, but... Uh, it made it a little wider and a little bit deeper, uh, each one of those events. And so when we updated the book, we did a few things. In the first book, uh, John called it the Brett's Floods. Nobody used that name. And, and in fact, all of us doing research still called it the Missoula Floods. And in fact, Brett's in his last paper called it the Missoula Flood, one flood. So we went back to calling it the Missoula Floods. Uh, secondly, uh, we've gotten away from using radiocarbon dates. And so everything is in calendar year dates. Because as you go back in time, radiocarbon dates uh, divert uh, from the, the other. And so we, we do that. Also, we added color photos, like this one that you see right here. Uh, 
Uh, in addition, nobody could understand our topographic maps, so we use shaded relief maps, which are much, much better, and LIDAR maps. Uh, and LIDAR is this new imagery where we use laser imaging, and we can see through the trees. We got a lot of trees in this part of Oregon and Washington, and so we need to do that. Uh, and then all of the books that are out there all end with J. Harlan Bretz, but he died uh, over 50 years ago. A lot has happened since that time, so I added a chapter called The Rest of the Story, like Paul Harvey would say. And so that's kind of fun there. And so we updated all the science, and it was fun doing this particular project. Um, and so here is a picture of J. Harlan Bretz, the guy that came up with these this whole story. Uh, and he's in front of Mount Rushmore. And as you can see, it says five great men in one photo, but uh, four of them don't show. He did have a wee bit of uh, an ego to go along with it. And his name, J. Harlan Bretz, he grew up in Michigan on the farm and everybody called him Harley Bretz. He went off to Albion College where he did his bachelor's degree in geology. Uh, and he got there and he said, you know, Harley Bretz is not a real dignified name. Uh, and so what he did he, is he changed his name back to his given name, Harlan. And then when he was working on his PhD, he said, Harlan Brett still isn't dignified. I'm going to put a J in front of it. And when he handed in his PhD dissertation, it said J. Harlan Bretz. And his advisor said, what is this? And he said, I'm now going to be called J. Harlan Bretz. No period. It's just a J. A J doesn't stand for anything. He just wanted to become more dignified. You can imagine what these graduate students at Uligan Press would do. And they say, Burns, you forgot all of the periods behind J. Harlan Bretz. No, there isn't one. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so that's the, the name there. Now, I'm going to have the final slide at the beginning just in case some of you fall asleep. Uh, and, and, and so you at least go, can go home with something valuable. And so at the end of the last glacial age, you had all of the continental glaciers coming down from Canada. It, they should be over here too. Uh, and they were melting. And so all of that water was going into the major stream systems and the Columbia River was the major one uh, that was here. But there was one lobe uh, of the ice from the continental ice sheet that came down the Pondere Valley. It's that little part of Idaho that sticks up here. And it dammed up the major river that drained all of western Montana. We call it the Clark Fork River today. And so there was no place for that water to go. And it filled up all of the valleys all the way back to Missoula. And, and so we call that Glacial Lake Missoula. And then eventually what happened is that ice dam broke. Uh, and that ice dam broke and all of that water, 540 cubic miles of water, catastrophically in three days emptied and came down with 50 cubic miles of ice, all of those becoming icebergs, down through Spokane and across eastern Washington, scouring out big deep valleys that we call coolies and we call uh, together, Brett's called, the Channel Scablands. All of that water came down into the Columbia River uh, at Wallula Gap, where the Columbia River today comes into it. And then it came down the Columbia Gorge, uh, and the gorge was always there. Uh, and then it came down to uh, the Portland-Vancouver area, hit the West Hills, and some of it went up north through Kalama and out into the ocean. Some of it went through Lake Oswego and filled up the whole Tualatin Valley back here. And the rest of it went between Oregon City and Westland and filled up the Willamette Valley all the way down to Eugene down at the end, which has an elevation of approximately 400 feet. So the water, so we were underneath a lake of four, that had an elevation of 400 feet. And probably two to three weeks that lake lasted before all of that water went back out into the ocean. And we have evidence that 89 plus floods made it down into the Spokane area, but only 40 of them got to here, 40 of them got down to here. Uh, and so that's the story that we're going to be talking about tonight. And, and so the Missoula floods are what we call the last uh, between 15 and 18,000 years ago, those 40 to 89 floods. Uh, but we've also, at the end I'll be talking about, we have a lot of evidence that the, these types of floods occurred all the way through the Quaternary, the last uh, 2.6 million years. And so those older ones I call the ancient cataclysmic floods. Together we call all of those the Ice Age floods. And so you'll see, hear those three t different names. So let's go back to the time of J. Harlan Bretz, a young assistant professor uh, up at University of Washington. Here, here is his field vehicle as he went out into uh, Eastern Washington, U.S. Geological Survey gave it to them. Standard graduate students there. Uh, they all wear hats in those days. We're a lot better dressed than geologists today in the field. Uh, but wherever he went, he saw these gigantic 
valleys that had been carved out. It sure looked like they were carved out by water, but where is the water today? Uh, secondly, he went to places like Dry Falls, which is a state park out in central Washington. Uh, and it looks as if this was a site of a large waterfall in the past, but there's no water today. And here's a D. Molinar painting of what it probably looked like in the past, as you can see uh, here. And he saw that. Uh, and then he saw these gigantic gravel bars that were out on the rivers today. Uh, and, 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 and how were all of these produced? Well, they were produced by big floods. And then I love this one. This is at West Bar, just outside of Wenatchee. Uh, and you can see all of the ripples that are in here. And we can take the wavelengths formed in between those ripples and look at the size of the class of the, the particles, the gravels and the cobbles that are in there. And then we can back calculate velocities. Vic Baker, famous geologist I'll talk about in a few minutes, did that. And he was calculating velocities up 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. That's unheard of. And, and so he, he uh, was seeing all of these landforms. And out in the center part of the state, he would see where all, all of the, uh, the geology was all scoured down. All the soils were scoured away down to the bedrock, the Columbia River basalt. And then there were little islands of loess that were left, uh, uh, the Palouse loess, L-O-E-S-S. -S. This is windblown silt that is all over eastern Washington. And, the, and they had been scoured away. What caused them to be scoured away like this? Uh, and then it, it, you can see in this particular area here, there is the Luss and the uplands, and here is the scoured out areas here. And then there were some very small little um, lakes that were scoured out, and they were scoured out by little tornadoes and these high-velocity floods that came through. We call them Coke Lakes, K-O-L-K. And so you saw Coke Lake scoured out, bedrock everywhere. And then when you go down into the Columbia River Valley, this is Washington, this is Oregon, this is I-84, and the Columbia River is deep down in here. And you can see where water levels got up to this point. That's all loose from there on up. This is all Columbia River basalt that is exposed down there. And you can just follow it all up and down the whole system. And so he saw all of these features and in 1923. He put together a first uh, paper, and he called it the Spokane Flood. A and he said that a large flood came down through Spokane, created the Channel Scablands, as you can see here. There is Wallula Gap, uh, and, and he described this. Now, the detractors of the day said, where did the water come from, number one? And number two, it's catastrophic. You're breaking the laws of uniformitarianism, this big, huge word that goes back to the beginning of geology in Scotland with James Hutton back in the late 1700s. And you just can't do that to break the laws. And so in 1927, he was invited to Washington, D.C., to the Geological Society of America meeting. And they said uh, to Brett, uh, we would like to have you present a paper on your Spokane flood. They didn't tell him that they had lined up five hydrologists with the U.S. Geological Survey after them, the top five in the United States, to tell him how wrong he was. And they did. Le the leadoff guy, O.E. Meinzer, the father of American hydrology, followed by James Galuli. He wrote the geology textbook uh, that I learned geology on way back when, Galuli, Waters, and Woodford. G.R. Mansfield, W.C. Alden, and E.T. McKnight. All of these guys crucified him. Uh, and he, by that time, he had moved back to the University of Chicago. And he said, I'm, forget it. I'm not going to do any more research on the Spokane flood. And he actually shifted his whole uh, uh, geological research area to uh, caves and, and cave formation, especially in uh, the limestone caves area of the mid-continent of the United States. But the onslaught continued all the way through the 1930s. And on the left-hand side, Ira Allison, a professor at Oregon State. And he, would, he had his own ideas. Uh, for map, He mapped out all of these uh, erratics, these different different rocks, granites and argillites and metamorphic rocks all up and down the Portland area, the Vancouver area, and the Willamette Valley. But he had other ideas as to how they got there. And then this guy on the right hand side, Richard Foster Flynn, Yale professor. He is the father of American glaciology and glacial geology. Uh, and a guy that was really well respected, he actually had been out here. He studied the Tushi beds, which I'll talk about in a second. Yet he hated Bretts, and he said, Bretts, you aren't right at all. And he just, any, he would go out of his way to tell Bretts how wrong he was. Now, when we rewrote the book, we got all these pictures of these old guys, because Marjorie didn't have them in the first book. And when she came in and was reviewing them, she said, this is my favorite picture in the whole book. And I said, it's just an old guy. 
What do you mean? And she said, well, you have to remember, I'm a Dickens novelist. And in every Dickens novel, there is a sleazy, greasy, uh, bad guy, Uriah Heap type guy. And boy, he sure looks like it. Uh, and so he was. He really was the thorn in the side of J. Harlan Bretz. And the onslaught continued until 1940. And this is when J.T. Pardee uh, broke the silence at that time. And he made a pre uh, presentation here in Seattle. Uh, and this was at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting that was up there. Uh, and he was there at that 1927 talk in Washington, D.C. And he turned to his friend uh, at the side and says, I know where the water came from. Because the, these guys were saying, you don't have a source of the water and you can't be catastrophic. Uh, and then he said, oh, and he had been working for the U.S. Geological Survey uh, for many, many years up in Montana. Who was his boss? All those five guys that crucified Bretts. Uh, and so he couldn't come out. But he, when he retired, he said, I'm going to tell the, story, the rest of the story. And he said, I've been working up in the Merkel Pass area in Montana, and I am seeing these huge ripples that go across here that are two and three miles long and 50 feet high, one after another after another. It sure looks like me to me that we've had huge floods, high velocities, high volumes coming through that particular area. And he says, okay, I wrote this paper. He actually wrote a paper on Glacial Lake Missoula in 1910 and had published it. Uh, and so he, he said, okay, uh, you know, remember I wrote that article, uh, that article about Glacial Lake Missoula. And then you got Marco Pass with all of these ripples. And then you got the channel scab lands that Brett's talked about over here. You put them together. Uh, and everybody said, wow, yeah. And they started believing. And then a couple years later, uh, he actually came out with a paper uh, that was uh, titled Rapid Emptying of Glacial Lake Missoula and Its Unusual Currents. And then people started believing. People started getting out in the field. James Galuli finally came to the Northwest, and he went out to Palouse Falls. And his first words were, how could I be so wrong? Uh, and then eventually everybody started uh, jumping on the bandwagon. And in the end, Bretz died in 1981. He wrote his last article in 1961 called The Missoula Flood. And he lived to be 98 years old. He outlived all the detractors that said that he was wrong. And, and so we tell young scientists, stick to your guns, especially if you think you've got enough evidence for that, because in the end, you will win out. And he did. Uh, and it is now into all of the textbooks today. But that's not the end of the story when Bretz died in 1981. Uh, one of the major players here, Vic Baker, he had, the two of us did our PhDs at the University of Colorado. Uh, and, but Vic was what we call a quantitative geomorphologist. He got the numbers. Uh, Brett was more of what we call a descriptive geomorphologist. He looked at the landforms and described them. But Vic would actually get out there and get, say, the velocities were such and such. The power of this river was such and such. And he uh, actually add a lot of credibility to this. Here is a picture of young Vic Baker with Bretts at his place in Chicago. Uh, and, and so uh, he was one of the major guys, and he's still researching on it. Vic is a professor at the University of Arizona. But his grandson lives in the Portland area. So he makes it up here as much as possible. Secondly, Richard Waite, who lives here uh, in Vancouver, and absolutely fantastic geologist. And he had an ooh-ah moment that kind of propelled the study of the uh, Missoula floods to the next level. And so in the 1970s, he and Vic Baker were saying maybe two to three different floods. But I need to go back and show you this picture of what a graded bed is. When you have a big flood and a lot of sediment goes into an area and then the water stops, what happens is the biggest particles fall out first and then the finest particles here. So if you have coarse grain sand, fine grain sand, you're going to have silt. Uh, and that's what we call a graded bed. Well, Richard was out in near Tushy, Washington, a place we call Burlingame Canyon, doing research for the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, and, and, and he looked over there and saw all of these beds. And each one of them was sand on the bottom, silt on the top. And, and he counted up all of them as approximately 40. And he said, wow, I wonder if those were Missoula floods. Uh, and that, that there were 40 of them uh, that got to this area. This was in a uh, backwater area. This is the Walla Walla Valley. So it wasn't where the main velocity went down through Wallula Gap. And so you had a lake there and particles were falling out. And he counted them up. And he said, maybe we had multiple floods. 
Uh, and so he published a paper in 1980 uh, about this multiple flood hypothesis. But when you do this, you're always scared that you're the Lone Ranger. Nobody else is verifying all of this. Uh, and, and, so, and so here, at, at the very bottom, there's the coarse grain sand, here's the silt from the next one down below. You can see where the ripples are moving the water in like this. There's a big mud ball that has fallen down into that. Uh, and, and so he saw all of those. Uh, and then about 10 of the, we call them rhythmites, 10 of them down, uh, there is two layers of ash. And we identified that uh, as Mount St. Helens S ash. Uh, geologists, when we find an ash layer, anytime we're digging in the, the soil, we find these white layers or tan layers there, we get very excited because it can give us a date. Uh, and so what we do is we take care, very careful samples, we ship them off to the major lab, which is at Washington State, out in Pullman, and they zap them, and then they give you a little number back, giving you all the chemistry, and they said it matches up with this particular uh, date and that, uh, 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 an example. And it's really, really neat. And he saw that, and he said, you know, these, why do you only get these ashes at one place? Uh, it, it has to be different floods that we're looking at. And so... Um, now, he's not the first guy that actually had come up with the multiple flood hypothesis. Uh, and, and two other guys, uh, jo uh, Jerry Glenn, who was a, a PhD student uh, uh, working at Oregon State University, he actually, down in Dayton, Oregon, counted up for the rhythmites down there. But he never published it, so he doesn't get the credit. But I'm giving him a little credit because he came up with that idea. And then Bob Carson, an absolutely wonderful professor out at Whitman College, also in the early days said, you know, it sure looks like there are multiple hypotheses. But it was the work of another uh, geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, Brian Atwater, who was working out of the Seattle office, working up in north central Washington. Washington. Uh, and, and he found examples of 89 different floods. And I'll show you uh, what these look like coming up in a few minutes. What he did is he looked at varves and then catastrophic layers in between. Uh, and so varves are light and dark layers. Anytime you have a lake, especially in a cool climate, uh, it will put down light uh, layers in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, when all the algae is in the lake, it will die and it will fall down to the bottom. So you'll have a dark layer. And then the next spring, the, the lighter sediment comes in. And then the next winter, the dark sediment. And so anytime we core any of our lakes around here, we will go through these silts, primarily silts. And we can uh, figure out how long that lake has been there by counting the varves. And that's what he did. Uh, and this is uh, a lake that was uh, formed glacially up uh, at, at the, near the Spokane area, and we'll show you that. And then so you have a lake here, and then a catastrophic flood coming in, and then lake back here. And he, he looked at these. He had 89 of them from the top to the bottom, and he didn't get to the very bottom. And so he said, it looks like we had many, many floods uh, that were a result of that. Many other workers, Pat Pringle, who uh, is the... Uh, worked for the U.S. Geological Survey. Now he is a community college um, a professor up at uh, Centralia, Washington. Jim O'Connor, who works with the U.S. Geological Survey right here. He's on the Portland State campus and an adjunct in our department. He was a Vic Baker student, and I'll use some of his data coming up in just a second. And, and so to conclude about the Missoula floods, uh, using radiocarbon dates, which we don't use anymore, uh, it's between 15 and 18,000 years ago, we had anywhere between 40 and 90 events. 40 floods got down here, 90 to uh, uh, the Spokane area. Some dates, Vic Baker and a few other guys are getting dates that are pushing back to 19,000. So I'm putting that in yellow. Those aren't completely verified yet. These are Richard Waite dates here with really, really good dates on it. So I'm sticking to those for right now. Now, is this the biggest flood that we have ever found? Up until two years ago, we said yes. Uh, second, second largest. And we, if you, you can't see all of these in the back row. But uh, the biggest one is in Altai, Russia. In fact, the top 10 are all glacial dams that break and, and flow out. Uh, and then we've got here, this is the di peak discharge in million cubic meters per second. That's a huge amount. 18 million was the one that was found in Altai, Russia. 17 million was the, the, the Missoula floods, the very first one that we had. Uh, and so, but then uh, just last year, uh, they, they found one in Iceland, uh, and, uh, another ice dam uh, flood that came out, and it was just a little bit bigger than that one. So this is the third largest one that geologists have found so far. And here are the Altai Mountains in Russia where all of this occurred. 
So, so that's the story of the development of the ideas and the theories through time. Let me take you all the way up to Missoula, Montana. Let's work our way down through here, through the Vancouver, Portland area, down to the coast, and, and show how it has affected everything. Here's the breaking of the dam here. There is the Ponderay Valley uh, that you have got. That was all underneath ice and then eventually uh, water um, when the Missoula floods came down through there. And so now with computers, it's wonderful. We can put in the height of the dam, uh, and then we say, okay, fill in all of the valleys and give us the size of the lake. So Glacial Lake Missoula looked like this. There is Missoula back here. And I'll show you some pictures uh, on the sides of the valleys back in this area. How do we know that? Well, if we go to the Missoula Valley, and so here is uh, University of Montana, the arch enemies of Portland State University. They kick our butts every year in football, but this year we're going to beat them because they're playing in Portland. Uh, and I think we, and the star quarterback from Portland State is from Vancouver, and he's going to have a great game. Uh, and, and so there's the big M up there, but if you look closely, you can see the old beaches that are there. But if we go down the valley, uh, after just a little bit of snow, you can see the old beaches of Glacial Lake Missoula. Uh, and what you do is you go up to the very, very highest beach, and that's your elevation of the, the lake there. And then you put that back in on the dam that you have back here. They put that elevation right there, and they say, computer, fill it in. Uh, and so that's, that's when we end up with 530 cubic mile, miles of ice. Uh, the elevation here is 4,250 feet. The size of that ice dam, 1,700 feet high. How big is that? Three space needles stacked one on top of the other. Uh, that is one big dam and a huge amount of water. The amount of water uh, in that lake was equal to half the size of, of uh, Lake Michigan, and it drained in three days. How do we know it drained in three days? We have a brilliant uh, uh, geologist here uh, at Cascade Volcano Observatory here in Vancouver who has been modeling this. And you put in the topography, you put in the water, you break the dam, and then you just let it flow, and you see how long it takes for all that water to get out. Uh, and he's got it out. Uh, and then he gets it down to Wallula Gap and the computer breaks. Uh, and so eventually he's going to get it all of the way through. Uh, uh, and, and, and we will know how long the water held, was held back at Wallula Gap, how long the water lasted in the Portland area and in the Vancouver area. And Roger's doing a wonderful job. And so at least we know th this initial part. Now, the why do we say the first flood was the biggest? Well, because what was happening is the ice was, was uh, the ice, the glaciers were melting. And so every, the glaciers were shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And so every time after the flood happened, then the glacier came back in because it was moving and formed a dam. But it was a little bit lower each time. And so the maximum size wasn't as high as it was before. And if, if the, the water levels went up and down and up and down, they'd wipe out all of those old uh, beaches that were there. And so with each one getting smaller and smaller and smaller, they preserved the beaches that were there before. Uh, and so that's why we say the first flood was the biggest one that we had. Now, just outside of, uh, of, of Missoula is a great section, and we call this the nine-mile section because it's nine miles outside of uh, Missoula. And this was studied by David Alt, a famous geology professor at the University of Montana and one of his master's students. Uh, and if you look at it, you can see light, dark, light, dark layers all the way up. And, and if you go up real closely to it, the dark layers are all varves, like I showed you before, little micro light, dark, light, dark layers in there. Uh, and then the, the light layers are pure silts and clays. They're what we call back swamp deposits. They're river deposits. So you have lake, river, lake, river, lake, river deposits there. What's happening in the valley there? Uh, when there is no ice dam, you have a river that is going down the valley. Uh, and, and so this is far from the main course of the river, and that's where the back side of the material is going to be deposited, that silt and clay. Then when it's under a lake, then you got the varves forming. And the very, very bottom section down here, there are 58 varves. So that first lake lasted 58 years before that ice dam catastrophically uh, broke. And so this is a great uh, piece of evidence showing that you had multiple floods. And, and you can see the varves, the number of varves decreases as you go up and up to the, the very top. And, and this is typical. Ge geologists love road cuts. And, and, and this is one of my favorite ones. Now, you, 
uh, when we would take our family on field trips, or on family vacations, my kids got to hear all about every uh, road cut that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And finally it got to a point they said, Dad, you do not speak until you are spoken to. Uh, and that got really bad. It really hurt me. But they never caught on that I developed hand signals. And when I grabbed my ear, my wife Glenda would say, oh, Scott, tell me about that over there. And I had been asked, and, it, and, and we, they would get an explanation. So it, 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 but it didn't work in the end. All three of my kids are artists. No science genes passed on. And I failed in the end. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the ice. Uh, and so here we have got, this is Glacial Lake Columbia. This is the sand poil arm where uh, Brian Atwater uh, had his series down here. And we had not only the ice sheet coming out of the Ponderay Valley here, uh, and, and we also had other uh, segments of the ice sheet, but you had a very, very large lobe coming out of the Okanagan Valley. Now, the first five floods, it wasn't this big, and I'll show you how big it was. But eventually it got down, and this is where the Columbia River flowed right here. Came to a point where it dammed up the Columbia River. And, and so uh, there was no place for the water to go, and it just backed up in this particular area here, filled it up to an elevation of 2,400 feet elevation. So some places that lake, Glacial Lake Columbia, was up to 500 feet thick. Uh, and, we, we, and that's where you get these varves, and then when a catastrophic flood would come down through, then you would have high velocities and that very, very catastrophic mix of sands and gravels that was in between. Uh, and so we're going to go over here to the left-hand side over here. Uh, this is between Spokane and the Ponderay Valley. Uh, and in this whole area here, uh, you've got a lot of these coke lakes. Everything is scoured out, uh, and a lot of material is deposited. This is the Rathdrum Prairie. And this is where you get the highest velocities right there. Jim O'Connor's calculated this out 17 times 10 to um, uh, 6 or... 17 million cubic meters per second, that is very, very fast. Now, when you uh, figure out the cubic meters per second down at uh, Wallula Gap, it's down to about 10 uh, million cubic meters per second. And so there's an attenuation as you're going further away. Uh, now, let's go back over to the, the Wenatchee area. Uh, and you can see for the first five floods, the Okanagan lobe wasn't that big. So it was up here. And there's a Chelan lobe coming down. And so here's the Columbia River that's flowing down in through here and down through Wenatchee. Richard Waite has, just down to the south end, he has got five of these rhythmites at the, uh, at the base of that area. Now, those rhythmites are very, very coarse. And you've got uh, boulders and cobbles on the bottom, then sands, and then silts on the top. Uh, and then they end. There are no more of those. And he says at that particular point, then the glacier has grown down here, and so as the water is coming out here in the Columbia and across the rest of the channels, Cablands, it hits the ice and comes down here. And then for the maybe next 10 floods, it goes in here and carves out a valley, and that's what we call Moses Cooling. And then it grows up even bigger all the way down to here, and that is the biggest extent. And the, when the water came out, then the water is deflected and comes down here and forms another huge coulee that we call the Grand Coulee. Uh, and, and you can see that. Uh, and, 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 and so that's why we have got those two major coolies. It's because the water hit the, uh, the ice in between. And so here's the Moses Cooley, and we believe that that uh, probably at least 10 major flood events uh, that, that formed in. Uh, and then when we look at the whole central part of, of, of Washington, you can see where the flood waters came down. I'm going to show you Palouse Falls, which is right down in this area. There's Wallula Gap. All the water eventually comes through down here. When you get into the Quincy Basin and uh, uh, Drumheller Channels, oh my God, it is just phenomenal. Every time I grow, go through there, and it's, it's still quite a bit, I just, my mouth is agape, just like, wow. How could anybody not believe in the huge floodwaters coming down through that area? If this is a Landsat photo, a satellite photo, and if Bretts had only seen this back in 1920, it would have made life a lot easier. And he actually did get a chance to see some of these. Uh, and you can see there is the Spokane area, those are Odessa, but there are the Channel Scablands uh, coming down in through here. And there's Grand Coulee Dam that is right over in that area there. And then when you get down to the Quincy Basin and all the potholes, and you say, oh, wow the power of the water coming through that particular area, it is just phenomenal. And then you come to Palouse Falls, uh, and Palouse Falls, uh, the whole valley is at the end of the Palouse Coulee that was carved by this, and then I love this picture in the wintertime uh, there. 
And then all that water has to go through uh, Lula Gap. Now, when you're on the river, it's huge. I mean, it is big. But when you're dealing with 530 cubic miles of water, that is a lot of water to get through there in a very short period of time. So using our shaded leaf maps, you can see uh, it, there's a long stretch that that water has to go through here. Now, when it backs up, it goes up through the Walla Walla Valley, and that's where these uh, Tushi beds and these uh, rhythmites were formed. And also the water goes back up in this direction, too, up in the Akama Valley, and forms uh, a, a lake there. And so what I've done here, there is Wallula Gap down here, but all that water is trying to get through, and it can't, and so it backs up and forms a huge lake. We call that Lake Lewis, after Meriwether Lewis. Lewis, who talked about some of these deposits, went all the way through Prosser, all the way up to Yakima. And we find as, ice, not ice rafted, ice rafted uh, boulders <laughs> up, <laughs> up in this area here and over here, and there's Tushi, where those Tushi beds uh, were found before. And the, the elevation of these, about 1,250 feet elevation, that's the top of Wallula Gap, which is right down there. Uh, and so when you go into Burlingame Canyon, eventually, I'm hoping this land will be bought made to, made into a state park or maybe even a national monument, uh, and so people can come out and see that. Look at the size of the rhythmites down at the bottom. Much, much larger, and then they get smaller and smaller as they go up, and again, that's because we believe the, the last flood uh, was the smallest one. Uh, and then the water comes through Lula Gap, and then it comes down the Columbia River, but spreads out. That's Lake Condon, named after Professor Condon, the father of geology in Oregon, a University of uh, Oregon professor. Then it comes back, it goes down through the Dalles, uh, and uh, it slows down a little bit. And so forming this lake here, and then some of the water will come out of the uh, river and come down into the John Day River, uh, and then come here, and then some of it will go up the Deschutes River. How do we know that it got all the way up here and all the way up here? We find these ice rafted erratics that we'll show you in just a few moments. And so the next picture is going to be here looking back up. And so here we are, Arlington is off in the distance, uh, and Philippi Canyon is over here. And if we were watching this, uh, and Jim O'Connor tells us that as the water is coming down the river, uh, it would probably take a half an hour to an, maybe an hour for the water just to fill up and then flow continuously for a couple weeks uh, at these high velocities of the waters coming through. The water would be very, very dark with all of the sediment that was in it and then bouncing uh, uh, through it lots of uh, icebergs that were being carried by it. Uh, and then if we uh, look at Philippi Canyon, which is here, as the, water, the last picture was down here, the water goes around the corner, it scours, and so you got scab lands down in through here, so the water's going down to the John Day. But as the water goes around the corner, the velocity drops, and what happens? You get a de deposition of sand and gravel in there. And so here are 150 geologists, the friends of the Pleistocene, who are out here looking at all of these deposits in these uh, areas. Uh, and, 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 and there are lots of them all up and down the Columbia River, all formed by these floods. And then as you go down towards the John Day River, you have got these beautiful scabland topography also ca caused by the floods. Then the water comes down the gorge. Uh, and as it, as it comes through, the gorge is already there, but it scours off, especially on the Washington side. There, it's just solid landslide after landslide after landslide. And so as the flood waters end, then the more landslide material comes down. Uh, and so uh, here we are at Cascade Locks, the most famous landslide, the most studied landslide in the Pacific Northwest, the Bonneville landslide, the Bridge of the Gods landslide came down here. But it was not caused by the Missoula floods. This is only 550 years ago. We believe it was caused by an earthquake, possibly on the Mount St. Helens fault zone. Uh, but all of this area over here and all the area over here is all landslides that, were, uh, that came down into that particular area. Why is it the most studied uh, la landslide in the Pacific Northwest? We built our first dam on the Columbia River there. And you don't want to build a dam on something that's going to be moving. It's not a good idea. Uh, and then as the water came down the gorge, it scoured a volcano. This is Beacon Rock, and think of it as being a, this is the volcanic plug, the center part that was there. This is the youngest volcano uh, in, in the Portland, Vancouver area. These are one of the boring lavas. The uh, uh, Prune Hill, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, just out here right next to Camas is one of those. Rocky Butte, right across the bridge, right next to the airport is one of those. Uh, Rocky Butte is 97,000 years old, and this one is 55,000 years old. And so it got scoured away by the Great Missoula Floods. Beautiful columnar jointing because this is a basaltic andesite. Uh, so, it's right, it, so it is basically basalt that you have got. 
And then as the floodwaters came down the, the gorge, uh, this is um, Crown Point, uh, and then this is uh, uh, Rooster Rock State Park that is here. Rooster Rock used to be right up here. And they, the last flood that came down under, uh, uh, undercut the, the cliff. That whole thing came down on a landslide. This is a whole landslide over in this area here. Uh, and it's still creeping today because that poor road up there keeps dropping a, a few feet every year. And, and so Rooster Rock was brought down here. Now, how did Rooster Rock get its name? Well, it goes back to the time of, of uh, Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery as it was coming down the river. And they hadn't seen a woman other than Sacagawea for a long time. And they see this big thing sticking up, this monolith sticking up uh, next to the river. Uh, and they named it a four-letter word that rhymes with rock. Uh, and, and in fact, it was used by everybody afterwards. When the people on the Oregon Trail, my ancestors, when they came down there and they were floating their wagons down the river, when they got to such and such a rock, they knew that they were getting close to the end. But then when they started making the first maps, they couldn't quite put that name on the map. And so a synonym happens to be rooster, and so therefore the name Rooster Rock. But Rooster Rock has its origin in the Missoula floods. Then the water comes into the Portland-Vancouver area. This work is really exciting. Uh, and so it's coming out of the gorge at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. Uh, and, and as it comes out, first of all, it, it widens up. And so as it widens up, there's more space for it and the velocity drops. And so you've got a huge bar right here of sediments where the sediment drops out in Troutdale. Uh, and then the water comes out and hits Prune Hill. There's Camas down here. There's Prune Hill, one of these boring lava volcanoes. And it's just like putting a rock in the middle of the stream. When you have a, a rock in the middle of the stream, the velocity in back of it decreases. And so any sediment that is being carried is dropped out. And so you get a pendant bar of sediment in back of it. What are we on right here? What is most of Vancouver on? It is on the Mill Plain pendant bar. Uh, that is formed as the water goes up in this way, area carves out Lacamas Lake, uh, or at least the basin that Lacamas Lake is in, then Burnt Bridge Creek, and then comes to, right down in through here. And so this huge uh, pendant bar is a result of the Missoula floods. Same thing's happening on the Oregon side. We've got a smaller volcano over here, Rocky Butte. It scoured out the area in front of us. And if any of you grew up in the Portland area, uh, that area, uh, area was where the county jail was. And they were actually banging on rocks down in there. Now that's where I-84 and 205 cross down in that area. And so you have got a pendant bar called Alameda Ridge in the back of it. The waters went this direction. The waters went around here, carved out a valley, Sullivan's Gulch, where I-84 is. Where you, you're in a valley, and you say, wow. Beautiful, probably carved by water. Where's the water? Well, it's gone because it was part of the Missoula floods that you have got. And so the waters came in through here. You've got big gravel bars. Glendevere Golf Course over here is on that. Uh, this is the Hawthorne District that is out here. Uh, and, and then you got some small volcanoes there where you get some more deposition. So uh, you, with the flood waters coming in, you're forming a lot of the uh, landforms that we have in this area. The area right up in here is also a neat story, too, because the water goes up in here, a lot of scouring. So a lot of the valleys that we have up here are all a result of the Missoula floods carving it, and then the water eventually gets it back out into the main channel out there. Uh, and, so, and then the water comes down he through here, goes through Lake Oswego, fills up the Tualat Valley. You can see the big fan that is right down here of sediment that was carved out of here and then deposited here all the way out to Sherwood. And then the rest of the water goes between Oregon City and West Lynn and fills up the Willamette Valley. Then uh, up to a level of about 400 feet elevation. And then that lake eventually goes down as the water goes back out into the ocean. And then you have the water going back out. Uh, and so as the water is coming out of the, the Willamette Valley, it can't make a sharp turn. Some of it does, as the river does today. It makes a big, huge turn like this, goes out through Clackamas Town Center and down through Milwaukee, right through the Eastside Commercial District, right through the Lucky Labrador Brew Pub. Geologists always use brew pubs as our geographic markers. And then the water comes right out here to Swan Island, and you have a big eddy that is formed there. Uh, and, and that's Swan Island, but on the other side, there was a lake. There was a big gouge. That was where Giles Lake was. 1905, the Lewis and Clark Expedition was there, was on a lake. It's now all filled in with junk uh, since that time, but it was all there. And then eventually the water went out into the ocean out here. 
Uh, and so you've got water coming in, water coming out, causing the different landforms that you have in the Portland area. Thank goodness for Photoshop and graduate students. This is what downtown Portland would have looked like if it was filled up to 400 feet elevation. And there's Swan Island with the, the, the very, very big eddy current cut into the pendant bar on Alameda Ridge. Now let me talk about these ice rafted erratics. Because what is the rock that we have around here? We got basalt, 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 basalt. Uh, and poor kids growing up here, if they just go and get the normal bedrock around here when they do their third grade uh, geology collections in the uh, egg cartons, it's basalt, 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 boring. But if we take them out uh, to the uh, area, the, the delta of the, uh, the, the Sandy River, which has the greatest diversity of rocks in the Portland area, you can get rocks that have been coming out of the Cascades, you get the andesites and the rhyolites, and then everything coming down the Columbia River and the Missoula Flood. So you get granites, you get these metamorphic rocks from eastern Washington and, and eastern Montana. And it's really neat, but the, uh, the, very commonly you get these big granite boulders. We have no granite around here. And when you see these white rocks, where is it coming from? Well, those are ice rafted in. We found a 25 ton one in, in Tualatin about three years ago. Uh, and, and we keep digging these up, so to speak, when they put in foundations of buildings. But the most famous of all of these uh, was found down in West Lynn. What elevation? About 400 feet elevation. And that is the Willamette meteorite that was found back in 1905. Uh, and, or 1902, uh, and then sold to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Uh, and it's something this big should have produced a huge crater, but it didn't. <laughs> and in fact, Dick Pugh, an adjunct professor in our department, went out to the site and actually found little gravel pieces with granites and other types of erratic types of rocks uh, that were there, showing that it was probably ice rafted in, in the past. And so the, the water uh, went through Lake Oswego, as you can see here, filled up the Tualatin Valley with this big fan that is out here. I'm going to show you a picture right here where we have a shopping center now called Bridgeport Shopping Center right on I-5. And then I'm going to show you right next to it where you can have some high-velocity rhythmites. Uh, and so I, back in the early 90s, I would take my students there. And you can see where Lake Oswego is to the right, you can see what we call forset beds as the water is coming through and depositing all those sediments and depositing it, showing it, that it, the water is going from right to left. And then just up the road there, we see these rhythmites. Uh, and, and so you've got gravels and cobbles, sands, silts. Gravels and cobbles, sands, silts. Gravels and cobbles, sands, silts. Uh, and you count those up. And so those are also rhythmites, and those are the deposits, but in faster velocity uh, areas that you have got. Uh, and then in the West Hills of Portland, uh, in between all of those floods, you, uh, you have silt everywhere out on the floodplains. And what do we have in the wintertime? We got those east winds, those dominant big east winds coming. They blow the, the silt up into the West Hills, lots of trees up there, captures there, and then when the it rains, all that falls down. We have up to 150 feet thick of silt, the Tualatin Mountains, right across the, the Columbia River from you here, uh, we got lots of it. We also have quite a bit uh, up in back of Vancouver too, on, in back of Camas up in the hills. Uh, this is this windblown silt, L-O-E-S-S, -S, the, the one word in geology that has more pronunciations than anything else. Uh, if you're educated or your professor was educated in the Midwest, you will call it Luss. Out here in the West, we call it Luss. If you're German, it's Lurs. And if you're in the South, y'all, we call it Lois or Lois. And, and so it has many terms, but it means windblown silt, and we got a lot of that around here. And, and then eventually what happens is the water fills up the Tualatin Valley. I know we have at least one person in here who lives in the Tualatin Valley. Uh, and you see it comes through right here uh, up to about 350, 400 feet elevation, and then it comes back in the major areas, Tonkin Scablands between Tualatin and Sherwood, and through Tualatin, and through Gaston, and down through Newburgh, and then uh, two years ago in Lake Oswego right here, we drained it uh, to fix a sewer line, and a very sharp and astute geologist, Gary Peterson, who was watching it, noticed that there was a delta in that direction, so the waters actually moved back in through there too. Uh, and then if we look at the whole uh, Willamette Valley all the way down to Eugene, here is the Portland area, there's the Tualatin Valley here, you can see uh, it got up to 400 feet elevation in 
How do we know that? That's the height of all of the, the highest erratics that we have got. Ira Allison, this is his map made back in 1935. He hated Brett's, but he actually gave us a lot of details that we had to explain at a later period of time. I'm going to show you a picture right outside of McMinnville uh, near Willamina of a ice rafted erratic. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a picture down here very close to Corvallis. Where the, uh, so up in this area, up in Newburgh, the uh, rhythmites for the uh, Missoula floods, 130 feet thick of these sand silt, sand silt layers that are there. Uh, but then as we get down, it gets uh, sm uh, smaller and smaller. So this is what we call the Bellevue erratic. It's an argillite. Uh, and so it is a metamorphic rock that was originally shale. Uh, and uh, it's at 400 feet elevation as you're going down to the beach. If you go down to Lincoln City, uh, you, there's a big sign that says Glacial Rock on the right-hand side. It's now surrounded by lots of great vineyards, the Amhill Valley Vineyards, very good wine. Uh, and, and, and so here, uh, this is ice rafted in. And then as we get down uh, Irish Bend, just south of Corvallis, you, there's the old soil, the paleosol on the bottom of the Willamette Valley, and here are your rhythmites. There are 40 rhythmites in here. You can see where a stream has cut into it since that time. Uh, and then after all of that water comes back into Portland, then it's got to go back out into the ocean. Remember, uh, uh, during the ice ages, sea level was 300 feet lower. And so we had a huge valley, like a Grand Canyon, uh, like up to uh, 50 feet to 100 feet deep here, all the way out to 300 feet deep, all the way out past Astoria because the edge of the continent was way off of the shore. Uh, and, and so the water went back out into the ocean there. But there's a huge story that we're just beginning to uncover out on the Astoria fan. So here's Oregon, here's Washington, and, and you've got Willapa Canyon that comes out here. And there's the Juan de Fuca plate. And so we're, we have a chain of volcanoes off of the coast generating a plate that's moving in that direction, 404 uh, centimeters a year. And then the Gorda plate down here. But the, the Missoula flood sediments are found all over the Astoria fan, all the way down to the, the Blanco fault zone here, all the way to the back side of the Gorda, all the way to the Mendocino fault zone. That's the San Andreas that goes out to the ocean. And sands from the Missoula floods all the way up into here. Uh, and so eventually when we get out there and sample some of these, we are going to put together an incredible story. The interesting thing is there are 700 cubic meter, or cubic kilometers of sediment out here, only 20 uh, cubic uh, kilometers in the uh, Willamette Valley. Uh, and, and so a large amount of erosion that has occurred there. Now, remember I said we were talking about Missoula floods. These ancient cataclysmic floods are examples of floods that have occurred during the last 2.6 million years, the ice ages. And so if you go up to the Dalles, and this is on Highway 197. The Dalles are down here. There is the, the uh, Columbia River here. There's Washington. We're on the Oregon side, and you come up, and there is uh, a road cut here. And again, road cuts are very exciting to geologists. And you, you've got, you can see a layer right here, another layer right here, another layer right here. There's another layer down here, and you can't see the lowest one, which is buried down at the bottom. Uh, and each one of those is a caliche layer. Uh, so calcium carbonate that was deposited in the past. And, and so when my graduate student, Dave Cordero, who teaches up uh, 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 in Longview at the community college, I found this, he, he, we thought it was windblown silt. And these are paleosols in it, an interesting story. And we went out to start sampling it. And we were starting down at the bottom. We said, Dave, this is all sand and there's gravel in it. Those would be big winds. And then as we went up, that's what we were finding. And then this area here, it's all pumice little well-rounded, water-deposited pumice. And we dated it, Dybiki Waylay Tuff, only described before in Reno, Nevada, and it was an ash down there. We believe this is the only violent eruption from Mount Adams in the past, and it put a lot of pumice into the uh, rivers, and it, during one of these major floods, it was deposited. And so this is 600,000 years old, uh, we have a tool called uh, paleomagnetism, and the Earth's magnetic field flip-flopped 700,000 years ago. We have just uh, done paleomagnetic uh, studies on these sediments. We should be getting the results back very soon, and I'm sure that some of those are going to be reversed and so older than 700,000 years. So we have, in fact, we found just recently uh, three more. So we have five plus three. We have eight paleosols in here from eight floods in the past. Uh, Kat here is my PhD student, uh, and, and she is my master's student, and she finished a thesis up in central Washington mapping out these. She has 28 uh, different uh, um, 
uh, deposits of these ancient cataclysmic floods. This is in Othello. That, is a, that probably took uh, 500,000 years for that sea horizon, that calcium carbonate, to develop on these old flood deposits that we have down there. And then this is just outside of the Tri-Cities. And you're driving along, and you see a little ridge, and you see another ridge in here, and you scratch the brake, stop, go look at it. Uh, and then we see in there the rock, look at all of the granites and the diorites and quartzites. Uh, you don't find those around here. They're all coming from up in Canada and then also from, uh, from up in Montana. Uh, and then they're all cemented together by this calcium carbonate. And to get at least this level here, you're looking at 100,000-year-old soil. Uh, and so uh, it's showing us old deposits. If it was all basalt, then it wouldn't tell us anything. But if we've got these exotic class in there, it is. And then uh, uh, here's another area. This is also on the Yakima River in the Tri-Cities. And we have a nice pa uh, paleosol uh, up here on top. You can see it right here, all cemented together with all this calcium carbonate. At least 100,000 years old, but underneath it. Look at this. There's Erica down there. And there are 14 rhythmites. If you look closely, there's one here, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's one, there's one, there's one. And these are all silts on the top, sands on the bottom. And, and on top, 100,000-year-old soil. And so these types of floods occurred in the past. That's very exciting. I also wanted to mention other one big super catastrophic flood. Uh, we had a large pluvial lake during the ice ages that, uh, the, uh, in Utah. And the Great Salt Lake is the remnant of it because most of it has dried up. And that was called Lake Bonneville. But it catastrophically broke out of northern Utah, came down into the Snake River floodplain, uh, and then came all the way out uh, uh, into the Columbia River, and then down into the Columbia Gorge. It was about 17 million years ago, plus or minus two, uh, and that was uh, years ago. Uh, and if we go up towards Lewiston, Idaho, uh, so here is a picture of the Bonneville floods. There is Glacial Lake Bonneville. Floods came down in here, and then, uh, so it's only one flood that we have evidence for. But if you go up to Lewiston, uh, you can see, here, here are the Missoula flood sediments here, and here are the Bonneville floods. Look at the foreset beds in this direction. Water is coming from here to here, there, and then on top, you've got the Bonneville floods up there. So it is an exciting uh, intermingling of these two major floods that occurred in the past. Now, some of you may have heard my talks on terroir, and, and another part of my research program is into the relationship between geology, soils, climate, and wine, and that's what the French call terroir. Uh, and, and so I have to at least mention a little bit about uh, wines and terroir and relate it back to the floods. And so this is the heart of uh, wine country, Pinot country in the Dundee Hills in the northern Willamette Valley. Uh, and then down at the bottom, you've got Missoula flood sediments. In Oregon, where do we grow the best pinots? You grow them on the sides of the hills. Uh, and, and where you've got the big red dirts, not down on the Missoula flood sediments. Why? Because the Missoula flood sediments got too many uh, nutrients in them. What do we call nutrients? Calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and phosphorus. Uh, and they, they, you want to stress the grapes. You want to reduce the vigor. You want the energy going into the grape and not into the leaves and stems. And so you want to stay off of the Missoula flood sediments. And because in Oregon, we use primarily dry land farming. We don't irrigate. Uh, and so you got to stress it some way. You use old soils like these red ones here where most of the nutrients have been um, taken out. You go up to the Yakima Valley, though, uh, and, and look at these beautiful vineyards. And what's this? It's ice rafted erratic that came up in here. These are all Missoula flood sediments that you've got here. Uh, and, and, and Washington is producing some of the best red wines in the United States. I think the best Syrahs in the United States are coming out of Walla Walla, but Yakima, Prosser, uh, and uh, the whole Columbia Valley producing great calves, Merlots, uh, Syrahs, etc. What's the difference between the two areas? Well, Washington, first of all, it's warm climate. So you have different types of grapes that you're going to have. But 95% of the sediment, uh, vineyards in Washington are on the Missoula flood sediments. Whereas in Oregon, which is a cool climate, 90% of the vineyards are on the upland areas and only 10% on the Missoula flood sediments. And so uh, you say, wait a second, Burns, you said that the Missoula flood sediments have too, much, uh, too many nutrients. And you're right, but how do they do that? They control the vigor by irrigation. They use drip irrigation, just give it enough water to keep it alive, and, and it will produce great grapes, and they do. Whereas in Oregon, where we don't irrigate, uh, you have uh, uh, the soils doing the job. Now, why did we rewrite the book? Our newest national park is a new concept, and it's called the Ice Age Flood Trail National Park. 
And here is a map of it. It's a new concept. Instead of going to a, a, a mountain or to a valley or to a canyon or something like that to see a park, you're going to follow a geological concept all the way from Astoria all the way up to Missoula. And the concept is to have 18 different uh, visitor centers all the way up and down visiting uh, Moses Lake and Dry Falls, etc., are going to be the heart of this. And you're going to be following this along to watch and, and follow this concept. And we wanted to have a book that dealt with the story, first of all, but then also the characteristics all the way from one end to the other. Congress passed this two years ago, but in all of its wisdom, it gave no money for this new national park. Zippo, you got one employee, and that's it. Uh, and so we're hoping that we get out of these wars and that we will eventually balance the budget and have some money uh, that we can uh, use for this new national park that is here. So if you fell asleep at the beginning, uh, or if the person next to you did, nudge them and then it's time to come back to, and I'll kind of conclude everything. So when we talk about the Missoula floods, we're talking about 89 floods that got to Spokane, 40 uh, that got down to the Portland-Vancouver area. Velocities up to 60 miles an hour. Uh, if you take the flow rates, of these floods, that is 17 million cubic meters per second, that's equal to the flow of all the rivers of the world, all added up together and multiplied by 10. Uh, the effects here, it affected 16,000 square miles in the Pacific Northwest, uh, which is incredible. The maximum uh, flood was the very first one, 530 cubic miles that we had there, but 50 cubic miles of ice and all of those ice rafts, a lot of them had big boulders in them and brought down. So when we talk about it, 15, 18,000 calendar years ago. Uh, and then we also mentioned the ancient cataclysmic floods, that these uh, have probably occurred all the way through the whole uh, last uh, uh, 2.6 million years. Now, the question always comes up, we're humans here, and we probably did have humans. The oldest human habitation that is verified and uh, all archaeologists believe in are the Paisley Caves, which are down in central Oregon. Uh, and they, uh, they have human coprolites, that is poop. It's fossilized and it's 14.5 thousand, uh, uh, thousand calendar years old, which puts it very, very close to the Missoula floods. Where were most of those people going to be living when they were here? They probably were following the salmon. They were probably along the rivers. And as the great Missoula floods came through, they wiped them out. And so we don't have any of those radiocarbon dated uh, place, uh, old, old sites where they would have been. Um, and so in the future, where is some of the research going? We're spending more time on these ancient cataclysmic floods, putting them together. How many did we have? What were the sizes of them? Uh, and then we, uh, when Roger over at the uh, Cascade Volcano Observatory figure, uh, gets all of the computer programs, we can figure out how long these Lake Condon, Lake Lewis, uh, Lake Allison, that was the lake that we had in the Willamette Valley, lasted. Uh, and then also the deep sea record, there is still a great record that is out there. But we want people to get out and see our greatest new national park. We live at the heart of one of the greatest geological of events to have occurred, not only in the Pacific Northwest, not only in the United States, but the world. And that is the story on the Missoula floods. Thanks a lot for coming out tonight. So we have some time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll come over and um, have you talk into the mic. I'm gonna start with a quick question though to get it rolling. So you mentioned the um, Erratic Rock State Park, the, the one down near McMinnville. Right. Is there, are, are there any of those erotic? Erotic rocks? I knew rocks? I was gonna say that. <laughs> Damn it. Any of those? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, any of those erratics here in close to the Vancouver area? Oh, all over Vancouver. In fact, I'm, on my list of things to do, I'm supposed to go and check a guy's place who's uh, just up Mill Plain. He said, I've got a big granite boulder in my driveway. And, uh, and so could you come and verify it as an erratic? And of course it is, but I'm, I need to get it. We have a big database. And so if any of you do have uh, Errat erratic rocks in your area, we'd love to know about it because we're, uh, Jim O'Connor, who I showed you a picture of, is putting all that together and it's very important. Okay, we got over some here. questions over there. So how did only half of them make it here? Oh, it, because each one kept on getting smaller and smaller. And so the, probably the last floods were the ones that were just not big enough. They didn't have the volume to get down here. That's our I, I, idea on that. It, what? 
the water just spread primarily across uh, central Washington. Now, some of it got uh, uh, smaller amounts, uh, made it through Alula Gap into the Columbia River, but uh, not large volumes that would produce rhythmites up in the Walla Walla Valley and, and also rhythmites down here. Yes, yes. Well, the, the glacier just wasn't as big. The ice dam, instead of being 1,700 feet high, maybe was only 400 feet high, then 350, et cetera. Yes, another well, question. And that was at the end of the last ice age, so it was warming, Right, and right? so the glaciers were getting smaller and smaller. Yep. Okay, over here. Uh, what do you think about um, improving the potential of Oregon Pinot Noirs by engineering a new Missoula flood? Well, <laughs> well you know, we want to stay off of the Missoula floods and, and above that, uh, but, uh, but a, a, again, Washington loves the Missoula flood sediments. Uh, but, you know, our climate would have to start going in the opposite direction to have another ice dam be, and have another Missoula flood. And so uh, the way things are going, we don't seem to be going in that direction. A good question. Yes. 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 Uh, this is Stephen Kern. Um, there's something that uh, I'd like to bring to the audience is that also it created one of the deepest holes. Uh, that's called Ponderay Lake. There at the beginning when the flood came, you'd mentioned that that thing's about 1,200 feet deep which rivals some of the trenches that we have here in the ocean. Thank you very much. And so the Ponderay Lake is right up there where the ice dam was. And you have that water coming out of Glacial Lake Missoula at huge velocities right there, scouring that out. So thank you very much. Good point. Hey, Good. I come from a math background, and this is my question. This might contradict some of the things that you said. You said that the first one had the biggest volume of all. But at the same time, you're also saying that the trenches become wider and wider, right? What, what becomes With wider? With every flood, the valleys become wider. Oh, oh no, no. What happens is as the water comes down, I was talking about the gorge. And so as the, as the flood comes down, it widens the valley. But then landslides fill it back in, uh, and they come down. And so after each flood, the size of the valley is basically the same. Oh. And, and so, no, the valleys don't get wider and wider. Oh, okay. Okay, but thank you. Uh, and using that mathematical background is always very, very helpful. Good job. Moving over to this side. Hi. Uh, are the floods that came down through the gorge, were they just primary solid ice like uh, ice flows, or was it water with a lot of ice in it? It was, it was primarily water moving at 50, 60 miles an hour with a few of these icebergs floating around. Remember, the first flood had 530 cubic miles of water and 50 cubic miles of ice. Uh, and so some, some of those icebergs are going to drop out uh, along the way as they're coming down, but that water is not. And, it's gonna, uh, and so the number of icebergs as you're coming down is going to be less. So really, there was not ice flow. It was fast moving. And if you were there, you would be wiped out and killed. So good point. And in the back yep. here. Hi, this is not a question, but I've known about this stuff for a while and I've been fascinated by it. So last October, I took a trip over to Great Falls to visit my son. And on the way, I made sure that I stopped in Montana and climbed up Mount Sentinel right up to the M there and looked over at Mount Jumbo and I saw those lines of the lake. And then I looked down on the Clark Fork River and it says, my gosh, that's where it all happened. And it was just thrilling to see it. Thank you for sharing for it, uh, this with, uh, with us. And I'm hoping that more people will do this because when you, when you do that, when you see the magnitude, the size of the lakes and the amount of erosion, it is just awe-inspiring. And, and thank you for sharing that. It's true. Way in the back. Yes, way in the back. Right around the Klickitat River where it meets the Columbia River Gorge, uh, there are roughly about seven layers um, so did the first flood come in and hit all those at the same time? Uh, what created those seven layers? Well, the seven layers in the bedrock or in the sediment? In the, uh, well, I, I'm not positive, but I would say bedrock. Yeah, and so all, so, oh, that's good because that's a different type of flood. Those are the floods of the Columbia River basalts. And so uh, right up at Lyle, Washington, where the click attack comes into the Columbia River, beautifully exposed all of those major layers of Columbia River basalts. Those are different flows. So uh, those, that bedrock, and it's found all up and down the Columbia Gorge, uh, and, and that 
all came out of the ground where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come together, starting 17 million years ago, ending 6 million years ago, but the majority of it, uh, about 85% of it came out between 14 and 16 million years ago. And just those flows came into the ancestral Columbia River, pushed the river over to the side, and flowed all the way to the coast. Every one of the headlands that we have along the coast, whether it's Cape Lookout, Cascade Head, Tillamook Head, all of those are basalt flows that came all the way from eastern Oregon. And so in Lyle, those seven layers that you're talking about are all Columbia River basalts. Those are earlier floods, those are volcanic floods uh, that occurred, and then the Missoula floods came on top of them. And while we're at Lyle, if you go across the river to the Oregon side, you have um, the overlook that is up there, Rowena. The floodwaters went over the top of that, and you can see some beautiful deposits of sands that are up there. We call those Mima Mounds, and those are another mystery for geologists as to the origin of those. That's another story. Okay. Another one down here in the front. Okay. We'll do one or two more. One, one more question. Well, it kind of relates to uh, the, the mounds. Um, do we know yet about the, the origin of the biscuits in the biscuit scab land? So the biscuit scab land or the Mima mounds or Mima well, mounds? Or, yeah, over in eastern. Yeah, and, and, and so, um, and, and so uh, all of the, and, and there, there's Mima Prairie. Uh, where they were first described, and we somehow have morphed it into Mima Mounds, and you also have them up, uh, also up in Olympia, and all up and down the gorge. Uh, you also have them up uh, at uh, Warm Spring Indian Reservation, all over the western half of the United States. And, and so what they are, they always have a solid uh, material underneath them, and then sandy, gravelly material on top. Uh, and then a lot of them have pocket gophers in them. And so the latest hypothesis coming out is that pocket gophers formed them. Uh, and they're in them. Uh, I'm a believer that something else formed them and then the pocket gophers came in at a later period of time. Uh, for many years, we thought that they were freeze-thaw processes, ice uh, forming and then melting and going back and forth and sorting out the particles. And then Link Washburn, a, fair, a very famous professor of periglacial geomorphology, that's the ice uh, formation processes, had a conference about 20 years ago uh, of all the top periglacial specialists in the world, and the one thing that they did agree on was that they did not form the Mima Mounds. Uh, I like the earthquake hypothesis. If you take a piece of uh, plywood and put sand on it and you hit it uh, really hard, all of the sand will go into little mounds. Uh, uh, and, and so I like that hypothesis. Up in Olympia, I like it. Tree throw uh, and, and uh, big ancient forest being blown over by a nor north nor'wester, and those are pit and mound topographies, and then the gophers come in at a later period of time. But geologists will continue hypothesizing in the future as to this. So, uh, is that Can I it? ask? One more question. One more, one more question. So you've answered this question for me before, but as a public service announcement, what can you tell us about the Missoula floods and radon? Oh, right. <laughs> and that's another area of research that I do, and that's radon. And by the way, we will be coming out next month with the complete radon study for Clark County because it never has come out by zip code. We've done it for the Portland area. Um, came out in 1993 with the first one, and then two years ago updated it with 50,000 homes for the whole state of Oregon and 30,000 for the Portland area, but nobody has done Vancouver. So I have um, uh, an undergrad who did, uh, dealt, we have 5,000 uh, house data here from, uh, in Vancouver. Um, and there is a direct relationship between Missoula flood sediments, coarse grain Missoula flood sediments, uh, the gravels and the cobbles that have high porosity uh, and uh, radon is a natural gas that comes out of the ground and it enters into houses. And EPA believes that uh, and states that the, uh, it is the number one producer of lung cancer in people who are non-smokers. Uh, and, and so therefore, uh, and in fact, all oncologists now, when you, they determine that somebody has lung cancer and they are not a smoker, they say, get your house tested for radon, and many times you find that it's very high. Uh, so we want to reduce the amount of living in uh, radioactive areas. And so the highest areas in Portland are uh, uh, Alameda Ridge, the Pendant Bar and back of Rocky Butte, and then all of the coarse-grained Missoula flood sediments around Portland. Where's the highest values in uh, Vancouver? It's Mill Plain. Uh, and may, huh? It's right here. Yes, and, and so when we come out with that study, uh, and so we'll make sure it's into the Vancouver newspaper in the Oregonian, uh, it, uh, it will have everything by each one of the zip codes. Uh, and I, I just tell people, get your house tested, and it's very cheap. You can get a short-term test, 
They're only $12 down at uh, Home Depot. But I recommend the long-term test, uh, which is uh, primarily, it's about $26. Uh, three months, do that in the wintertime. If you have a basement, be sure to put it in the basement. If you don't, then put it on the first floor. Don't put it in the call space. Uh, and that $25 or $12 includes the test. You, you uh, put the canister out, and then you uh, put it back in the envelope, send it off, and then you, they will send you back the, the data later on. If it's over four picocuries per liter, then it's uh, a, a high value, and we recommend that you do something uh, for your house. The good news is it's a geological hazard, and it's the cheapest of all the geological hazards to mitigate. Uh, if it's high, uh, uh, it will cost anywhere between 500 and 1,500 to mitigate your house. What they do is they fill up all the cracks, uh, and then they put in a fan system uh, to remove the, the air and then take it out into the atmosphere. Uh, and so this is an area with high radon. And so uh, you, I just tell everybody, get your house tested. You can be in a high area and have a low value because you have a newer house that doesn't have many cracks in it. Or you may geologically in your area have uh, uh, non-porous land. You've got to have a generator. Well, the Mo Missoula floods are loaded with the felspars and micas that have it. And then secondly, you need to have porosity. And of course, Great Missoula floods have that. So that is a, not the happiest way to end uh, the, <laughs> the talk here. But you know, it, it, it is important to do. Amanda, thank you for the invitation uh, to come and talk about the Missoula floods. If any of you are interested in buying a book, uh, they're out there. I will sign them. And again, all of the uh, proceeds go to graduate students at Portland State. Thanks again for coming out and supporting Nerd Night. Thank you, Dr. Scott Burns. Fantastic as always.